So my name is Talia Nasi. Today we're going to be talking about testing in production. I am a lead developer advocate at Akamai. And before Akamai, I was at a small cloud computing company. You may have heard of it. It's called Amazon Web Services. Am I allowed to say the A word here? Is that, yes, is that OK? OK, great. Wonderful. Um, and before I was a dev advocate, I was a test engineer. So I did testing for Visa and WeWork um, really early on in my career. So a few years ago, I was interviewing for this test engineering position, and I was super nervous. You know how you get when you, when you go to an interview, you know, you prepare as much as you can, but there's always like that little bit of fear. So I'm sitting in this interview, and I'm answering all the questions pretty well, and I feel really confident. And at the end, at the end of the interview, the guy asks me, he goes, do you have any questions for me? And up until this point, um, I was at a very waterfall company. You know, we had uh, three different staging environments. We had like staging, beta, and cert. We had like specific days where you would have to release code. It was all like very, um, very waterfall. And so that's what I was used to going into this interview. And so I asked the interviewer, I was like, when do you guys release code? And who's responsible for maintaining the staging environment? And like, how do the releases work? And I had so many questions about, about how they test. And he stopped me and he said, they don't have a staging environment, they test in production. And I was so shocked, I was like, what do you mean you test in production? What, what does that even mean? And I was so confused sitting in this interview um, and I, he could see that I was confused and so he asked me to do something that I would like all of you to do right now. So I want everyone to think about the last feature that your team deployed. OK, you got it? You're thinking about it? Is it working? Right now? In production? How do you know? Your users haven't reported anything to you, like your alarms haven't gone off. So you assume that it's working, right? But you don't actually know. So testing in prod is the only way to know that your features are working in production right now. And so this just means you're testing your features in the environment that your features will live in, not a dummy environment, not a staging environment, in the place that your features will live. And so most companies, and, and all the companies that I had worked for previously, um, use a staging environment or a test environment. Um, show of hands here, who uses a staging environment? Okay, now keep your hands up if it's an exact replica of production. Okay, liars. Okay, so testing environments really are not the way to go here. And let's talk about why. And these are some of the experience that I had that I'm sure you guys have had too. So firstly, staging environments are expensive to maintain, right? They can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Staging test results do not always match production test results. So imagine you're testing this feature. You know, you, you, either you developed it or, or you're just testing it. And you worked so hard on testing every requirement. You went through every page of the, um, of the requirement documentation with the product owner. You worked with the developers to fix all the bugs. Um, your end-to-end -end tests are passing in staging. So you, know, you sign off. You feel so good about it. It works so great in staging. Um, and then you launch the feature to production, and what happens? There's a bug. So these environments are different, plain and simple. Production includes data that staging doesn't have, and you're never gonna know the differences between production and staging until you test in prod. Okay, so picture this. You are testing a high priority fix for a feature, so you log into staging to test it, but staging is down, you get the 404 screen of death, um, so you ping the DevOps guy, but the DevOps guy is like, you have to open an IT ticket. And then you open an IT ticket, but it has to get escalated by your manager. And there's a hundred different steps you have to take just to get access to staging. Um, and really nobody seems to care. So no one's going to get a call in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner if staging is down. Really nobody cares. 
the load and staging does not match production. So if you think about the number of people who use your staging environment versus production, that difference is a lot. And because the load is different, the accuracy of speed and lag times is not gonna match, right? So many times when you write tests for staging, you have to add like, you know, sleep for five seconds or wait for 10 seconds, like wait for this to appear. And that's not, I'm not gonna wait 10 seconds for something to appear in production, right? So that's not how I'm gonna interact with something in prod, that's not how the test should work. And lastly, we have configuration drift. So, Let's say you get paged one night because there's an incident for your mobile application. And so you look at the logs, you figure out what's going on, and you identify what the problem is. And in order to fix the problem, you have to make a configuration change in production. So you go in, you make the configuration change, and you, know, you go back to sleep because it's like the middle of the night. So even though you've just you've fixed the issue, you've just created an even bigger divide between your staging and production environments because you didn't make the same change in your staging environment. So many times staging environments are not the same as production because of changes made during incident management. And this is called configuration drift. And at the end of the day, I've never heard anybody speak highly of their staging environment. But I know what you're thinking, like what could go wrong, really. Um, but what's the first thing you do right after you deploy a change? You go to production and you test it, right? Okay, so why isn't everyone doing this? Like, why isn't this like a common practice that like every company tests in prod and it's like a normal thing and you know, you don't get shocked when you hear about it? Like, why isn't everybody doing this? So companies don't test in prod because of this fear and this lack of trust in their systems, and for the same reasons, they refuse to engage in the tools and the process changes that are gonna generate that trust. And it really is an art, right? There's so many negative connotations associated with testing in prod. Some people think it's like the lazy way out, like if you don't care about your user experience, then you know, just wait until you deploy it to production and then go and test it, but that's really not the case. There's this common misconception that when you test in prod, you only test in prod. And again, that's not what we're doing, that's not what we're gonna be talking about today. So you should still have pre-production tests in place. You need so much automation place, this is not an easy process. Um, and you need a firm understanding of all of your, all of your um, systems. So let's talk about how do we do this? Like how do we set up testing in prod? There's a few steps that we have to take. The first step is to install all of the necessary tools. And the first tool that you need um, is feature flagging. And feature flagging is a way to decide which features. And what feature flags do is that they're used to hide, enable, or disable features at runtime. And a good way to think about this is that feature flags separate code deployment from feature release. So you can deploy a feature, but that doesn't mean it's gonna, you're gonna be serving all of your production traffic to it. So just keep in mind, product, that, keep in mind that um, deployment is not the same as release. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, basically, your developers are gonna create a feature flag from the UI and then target your internal teammates. So this is dev, this is QA, this is product design, and your automation bots. So anything related to the feature can only be seen by these users that are inside of the feature flag while the feature flag is off. So the people on the right, your end users, they don't see any changes, they don't see anything related to, to the feature or to that change. So if there happens to be a bug, if something's wrong with your feature, let's say you know you know there is something wrong, these end users are not affected, they don't see those bugs. While the feature flag is off, this is when you go in and you test everything. This is when you run your automation scripts, you verify all the proper functionality, you fix everything that, that you can, you make sure that everything works. And then once you know your feature is working and it's working in production, you turn the flag on already knowing that 100% your features are working and you didn't break anything that was existing and you give your users a really great user experience. And then you repeat this process with every new feature. So each feature will have its own feature flag. So I'm gonna go through um, how to do this with 
one of the UIs that, that I know. So there's a few different feature flagging tools that I'll list at the end of this, but um, there's Split, LaunchDarkly, CloudBees, Harness. For this demo, I'm gonna be using Split. So when you, when you go to the Split UI, you just go to Create Split. That's another name for feature flag. The first thing you have to do is name your flag, and then you're gonna include this name in your code. Your traffic type differentiates the people who see the feature versus the people who don't. So it can be by device, by employee, by location. I like to do it by user. And then once you create the flag, you set up the targeting rules. Like what specifically are you doing? Like what are you trying to test here? So in this targeting rule, I'm saying if you're in this list, you can see the feature, you have access to this feature, so QA, developers, product, designers, and the test user, the automation bot. So otherwise, if you're not in this list, you're gonna get treatment off. So this is a great way when I run my automation scripts, this test user is gonna be targeted in the feature flag, they'll have access to it. So in the code, I say if the user is in the, in the feature flag, give them treatment on, or else if they're not in the feature flag, give them treatment off. And then in the test, I'm gonna log in with that test user, run whatever test I need to do, check, make sure whatever functionality works, and expect that really cool feature to work. And so the cherry on top of this cake here is that when you turn on the feature flag in production, you already know that your features are working and there are no surprises. Let's talk a little bit about feature flag maintenance um, because this can become an issue if you don't have the right processes in place. So when we, when we look at um, feature, the feature flag lifecycle, there's four different stages. We have creation, implementation, rollout, and cleanup. So the first step is creation. I think the most important thing when you're creating a feature flag is to have a consistent naming convention. So there's a few options to choose from, like if you're using a tool like Jira, you can include the Jira ticket number, the name of the service that, that your feature flag is for, is for, the name of the team, the name of the functionality. You wanna engage with all of the different stakeholders that um, are gonna come in contact with this feature flag, that are gonna be using this feature flag. Make sure there's clear ownership and just remember, consistency is key. So if you start out with one naming convention, um, be sure to keep that consistency throughout your project. For implementation, um, changes to your feature flags should be treated like code deploys. Like that's how important they are. So if you require two code reviews to your code base before you merge um, anything to like your master branch, so your main branch, sorry, um, you should also have two reviews for any configuration changes to your feature flags because again, your these changes directly impact your users in production. Hold please, batteries came out. I did this during reInvent once, that was fun. Dropped the uh, clicker. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so by having the same approval process, you're making that, um, that impact a lot less in case something goes wrong because you don't want those mistakes to happen that could have been solved if you had like this approval process in place. So a question I get asked a lot is how do you know what to test in prod, right? Because we're not testing every single thing that there is to test in prod, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, what I would suggest is work with your product owner and prioritize what the most important flows are. You also wanna work with your data analyst and make sure that whatever users are doing the most, that are generating the most traffic, um, that those are also tested in prod. And again, uh, it's a good idea to target your automation bots inside of the feature flag so that once those, um, once those bots are targeted, they can have access to the feature um, before the feature flag gets turned on. So the next step is rollout. Roll um, users should consistently have the same experience. So what this means is that when you increase exposure to a feature, it shouldn't affect the current exposed population. And this is especially true when you're using like something like a production canary. So if you're in the process of rolling out a feature and a user visits your site, let's say they get um, the treatment should be on for that user, then every time they go to that site or they use this feature, they should always have the same experience. And then let's talk about feature flag cleanup. Um, I don't like to have a definition of done without having a feature flag removal part of it. So like a feature is not considered done until the feature flag is removed from the code base. Um, 
You want to remove the old code when you delete your feature flag. You don't want to have stale code or a feature flag that's just like been sitting in split or launch darkly that nobody uses anymore. You want to make sure that you keep that up to date. OK, so that's feature flagging. That's the first tool that we need. The next tool we need is an automation framework. And you need an automation framework because it's just not scalable to test everything manually. You want one that's easy to adopt, easy to debug, one that has good reporting, and one that has a good support community. And I'll give you guys a list of the ones that I recommend. The next thing you need is a job scheduler. And this can be something like a simple Chrome job, or it can be um, like every time you deploy your code, the tests are going to run. So this is like highly configurable. Next, it's important to have an alerting tool. You want to choose an alerting tool that can be integrated with your job scheduler. And it's important that everyone on your team is responsible for um, being on call. And everyone on your team should be on that on-call rotation because everybody owns product quality. It's not just the test engineer's responsibility to make sure that everything works. It's um, a team effort. So these are the tools that I've used for testing in prod. Um, there's so many different feature flagging tools, Split, Launch, Darkly, Harness, and CloudBees, I think, are the four um, big ones. For automation frameworks, I love using Robot Framework. It's like simple BDD, Gherkin, Cucumber. Um, there's Puppeteer and um, Just, and there's for job schedulers, there's Jenkins, Circle CI, and Travis, um, and for alerting, Alerting is also highly configurable. Like you can use PagerDuty for like you know 911. Our stuff is is breaking right now in production, and then for like everything's going well sort of alerts, you can use things like Slack. Okay, so now that we have all of our tools installed, we have to carefully create all of our test data, right? So the problem is we need a way to create and manipulate test data in production without affecting real end users um, or any data or analytics. So what we do is we create a consistent naming convention for our test users, something like a Boolean, like is test user equals true, and have that on for all the test users that we create. And these users are going to act like real users in prod. They're going to perform the same actions that a normal um, user is going to do. Um, but only we internally would be able to interact with them. So everything that happens with this is test user is true gets put in another database or in another table or over here. So this way you can differentiate between real people actions and test user actions. And so this is something that you guys need to um, follow like specifically for um, your team. So like you have to have these specific predetermined guidelines that everybody agrees on. Um, and your team needs to agree on these, on these guidelines ahead of time. Um, so that when you have these test users performing actions, doing things in prod, like someone from another team doesn't say, hey, what is this? Like, what's going on? So there needs to be like a lot of transparency here. And unfortunately, there is not like one size fits all for, for this. There isn't like a one size fits all sort of solution. This is what's worked well for me. Next, we need to write our tests. I like using BDD because it's um, simple for people who um, don't necessarily read code or know how to write code. They can just see like the given when then of, of what the use case is. It's really good when you're working with product or when you're working with you know, business stakeholders who need to know what's being tested. When handling third parties. So this happens a lot of times when you have third party integrations in your software and you don't really know how to test in production with them. So What's worked best for me is to have a header in the API request that you send to the third party and say, like, hey, anytime you get um, a request with this header, I want you to do X, Y, and Z with it, treat it this other way, or do this other thing, because it's for a test. And, and again, you can work with the third party to, to um, make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. So you can handle it differently with, with third parties from that API request. Again, I've done this a few times, and I've never had a problem. OK, next is set up and tear down of the test. So when you're setting up a test, you obviously like want to start from scratch. You want to clear all, all of your cookies, log in with the test user that's targeted in the feature flag. Um, in, in the test, you perform all the actions that you need to do, validate all the functionality. Um, the tear down, in the tear down, you want to undo undo everything, clean up the test, make sure you start again from zero. And if any step fails, um, you need to get alerted immediately, and the tests need to stop. So 
it's important that you set up alerts for each part of the testing process, especially when you're testing in prod. Like let's say you're testing in prod and um, you forget to, to clean up the, the test actions. You don't want that test data in prod if it, if it doesn't need to be there, if it's not part of the, um, if it's not part of the test. So once your test is complete, make sure the teardown undoes everything. And if it doesn't, that you need to be alerted. Okay, so next we need to deploy to a production canary. So this minimizes the impact if something goes wrong. So when you use a production canary, what you do is you slowly roll out to a small subset of users before you roll it out to the entire population. And it's important to use um, production canaries for risk mitigation because if for some reason there is a bug and you don't catch it while the feature flag is off, let's say you catch it while the feature flag is on, you turn the flag on and oops, like something is, is out there in production, would you want 100% of your users to encounter the issue or 1%? So this is a great way to have that risk mitigation in place. Um, you can identify the issue, roll back to a good version and fix the issue in a controlled environment. There was this global outage um, that Cloudflare had in 2019. It was caused by a code deployment that was like meant to be um, meant to be dark launched, and here they didn't use a production canary, and it affected 82% of their user base. So infrastructure and configuration changes should always be released with a canary. These are very sensitive changes, um, and I highly recommend that you use a production canary here. Next, we want to set up monitoring. So. There's so many things that you can set up monitoring for. Monitoring is a must have, like at every phase of the production rollout, especially, um, especially when you're testing in prod. So some things you can monitor are if there's an increase in error rates, if there's a decrease in like the overall request rate to the service, um, and if there's an increase in latency. Okay, I also wanna make something very clear. Let me just make sure my mic is on, okay? So there is no such thing as a flaky test, um, especially when you're testing in prod. If a test fails and it continuously fails, something is wrong and you need to go figure out what's going on. There's no such thing as a flaky test. So one of the main reasons that people test in prod is, is because you have this test code that lives in the same environment as production code, and that really helps you build your confidence that if the code is working in prod behind the feature flag, then it's gonna work in prod when the feature flag is on. But it's kind of like a double-edged sword because if you don't set it up correctly, if you don't have the right things in place, it can be very risky. So you do need to mitigate risk. Um, these are some of the ways that you can do that. So before launch, use feature flags to target your users. After launch, use production canaries to limit the audience in case something does go wrong and you need to roll something back. You do have like that off button. Um, you can use something called an AA test. So if you've never used feature flags before, if you've never used um, any of the tools that I talked about, an AA test is a really great way to get yourself um, situated with them. So this means that you give your users inside and outside of the feature flag the same experience. And then you measure the data coming in and you make sure that it's the same on both sides. So this is a great way to build your confidence if you've never used feature flags before. And then again, you wanna start small. So you're not gonna start with, with your most complex flow that hits every service and touches every third party and say, yep, that's the one, I'm gonna start right there. You don't wanna do that, you wanna start small when you're testing in prod, build your confidence and work up. A lot of times, the most difficult part of testing in production is shifting your company's testing culture. So this is, um, this is kind of like that initial aha moment when, when I was in that interview and I'm sure when, if some of you guys have heard about testing in prod is like it's not a typical part of a, a company's testing journey. So some things that have worked for me is explain why the pros outweigh the cons. Like, is your staging environment unreliable? I can tell you for a fact, yes it is. Um, are there frequently issues that could have been caught if you were testing in prod? Um, think of examples from the past. So like, do you remember when we merged XYZ and it caused this issue in production? And then propose a path forward. So like, have you heard about feature flagging? Can we try it? I think most of the feature flagging tools have a free version you can try. Um, and you can start out with an AA test. So build your confidence in the feature flagging tool first and then slowly work up from there. 
So it's funny, I, I hear developers all the time and they're like, you know, it's four o'clock on Friday, like can I deploy this code? I don't know what to do, it has to be, it has to be, um, it has to be merged before the weekend and it's a big fix, I don't know what to do. And you know, people get nervous about deploying code on Fridays, you see stuff on Twitter all the time about it. Yes, you can deploy code whenever you want because just because you deploy doesn't mean you release it to 100% of, of your users. So this fear and that um, those discussions are gonna start to slow down once you start using this, this practice. Um, one of the other benefits is that the lead time to know if something is wrong is gonna be reduced and the confidence in your release is, is gonna be increased. Okay, so there's always gonna be those people who say, Talia, testing in production is never gonna work. It's just, it's never gonna work, and um, I'm never gonna, never gonna do it. So those people think that staging will never, those people think that staging is um, the way to go, but to those people I say, staging will never fully represent production. It's a sunk cost, and at the end of the day, like those people are not my target audience. Like I see you, I hear you, but I don't agree with you. So testing in production promotes a proactive engineering culture. Like as a test engineer, as an engineer for, um, for an organization, I'm not gonna wait until something breaks, have a user report it to me, go investigate what's going on, um, and then fix it. I wanna find out what's going on and fix any issues before anybody ever knows that something went wrong. So if this is something that you would like to do, if this is something that, um, that I've convinced you to do, um, firstly install your tools, your feature flagging, your automation framework, your job schedule, your alerting, and your monitoring. Um, create your test data and make sure that your test entities only interact with each other. Write your tests, make sure your teardown cleans up your test, especially when you're testing in prod, that's super important. Launch behind a feature flag, deploy to a production canary, and set up monitoring and keep up with maintenance. Okay, so in case you haven't been paying attention at all for the past 30 minutes, I want you to take away two things from this talk. The first is that nobody cares if your feature is working in staging, we care if it works in production, and the only way to know if it's working in prod is to test it in prod. Thank you, everybody. So we have some time for questions, I'm happy to answer. Or I just did like such a great job and you guys totally understand every part of the process. Yeah. So the question was, what's a good strategy for choosing your canary? I think it depends on the size of your population, and this is something you can work with your data analyst on to figure out like which which um, which pieces of software are being touched where. Um, from that, you can start out at whatever percentage. I would work with your data analyst on that. Yeah. So the question was, can you elaborate on third-party services? So. Um, that, that would mean things that are not part of your company. So let's say um, you're working on, on like a checkout flow and you have to send an authorization to you know, Square or to whatever payment process, like you would work with the engineers from them and say, you know, hey, if you get a request from this test user, do X, Y, and Z with it. So it would be external to your company. Yes, the question was, can you repeat what AA testing is? So AA testing is when um, you have a set of, um, basically you give your users in and out of the feature flag the same experience. So when I was talking about um, turning the feature flag on, you have users that are in the feature flag and you have users that are outside of the feature flag. So these are like your normal end users. Um, they are, most of the time they're gonna have a different experience because if you're testing something, you're testing a new feature, let's say you have, um, let's say you have you know, developers, QA, all of those people internally in the feature flag and they're testing something new, they're gonna have one experience while they're, while they're testing, while they're making sure everything is working. Once it's working, they're gonna turn on the feature flag so that everybody has the same experience. When you do an AA test, it, from the beginning, the people inside and outside of the feature flag get the same experience, so the data coming in is gonna be the same for both. So that's a way to increase your confidence in the feature flagging tool to make sure that the people in the feature flag and outside of the feature flag get the same experience. So the question was, how do you test without a deployment in production? Yeah, I guess my point is, is that like, 
Yeah, so for these, I, I would suggest like making sure all of your monitoring is in place, making sure that um, things like uh, a tool like Splunk would come into play really well here if you have like monitoring and logging in place for you know post-release or post-deployment. Um, personally, like when, when I do testing in prod, the, the most effective way to do it and to make sure that something is working is to do it in the, the, in the deployment phase and then to make sure that that test is running well after the feature flag is turned on. Um, but you can use like logging tools and monitoring tools after the test is, is complete. Okay, so the question was, what's my take on testing infrastructure changes? So when you're, two things. Firstly, when you're testing infrastructure changes, always use a production canary. And specifically for um, when you're testing in prod, this is, Th these, these work well, work the best when you're testing um, user facing like front end changes. I wouldn't suggest you know, doing back end changes, testing in prod that way. Um, this is more of like a front end UI user facing process. I wouldn't suggest like any back end testing like this. It, it could be possible, I just don't have experience with it. So the question was, how does this tie into A-B testing? It ties in very well. So there's, there's a few tools, you know, like I said, split and launch darkly, where they do A-B testing along with testing in prod. So, so instead of running an AA test, you can run an A-B test, have one set of users um, have one experience, one set of users have a different experience, um, but you can use the same tools for it. And they are separate processes, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't do, you can do an A-B test and test and prod at the same time, but um, they, they're separate processes that have different, different UIs, but you can use the same tools for them. Anyone else? Okay, thank you everybody.